Hello everyone, welcome to the discussion of clinical vignettes in pediatrics. I am Dr. Singaram, your pediatrics faculty. In this session, we will be discussing uh, some clinical vignettes or scenarios in the field of pediatrics related for your uh, MCQ exams. So, this will be related to a discussion of a clinical scenario which you are going to see in the OP or in the ward where how you are going to evaluate that particular patient. It may be related to investigating that particular patient or it may be related to the treatment or it may be related to the diagnosis in that clinical setting. That will be the discussion for clinical vignettes in pediatrics. We will discuss questions which are spread across the three sections of pediatrics namely neonatology, general pediatrics and systemic pediatrics as well. I will start the discussion with few clinical vignettes in the section of neonatology. This will be the first question. You are evaluating a 12 hour old term neonate with the complaints of not passing urine since birth. The baby appears to be otherwise well with normal findings on clinical examination. Okay, so the complaint here basically is not passing urine since birth and the age of the baby is 12 hours. You know that most of the babies, they pass urine soon after birth in the delivery room itself. Uh, however, few babies, uh, there may be a slight delay in the passage. So, what is a normal time for the passage of urine? That is first thing which you should keep in mind. Normal time is up to 24 hours, up to 24 hours. As you can see in this particular baby, it is only a 12 hour old baby. So, not passing urine doesn't uh, have any concern at this point of time, especially because the baby appears to be well and has a normal findings on examination. So, if I ask you, what should be the next step in the management? You have to provide reassurance to the parents that nothing is abnormal. Only thing you have to ensure is that the mother should provide adequate feeds to the baby. Adequate feeds to the baby. Like every 2 to 3 hours, the mother should adequately feed the baby. That is all that is required at this point of time when the baby is 12 hours old. Now moving on, the same scenario, the same baby, but even after 24 hours, the baby has not yet passed urine. What would be the next step in the management? Now, this is already 24 hours and still the baby has not passed urine. This becomes a cause of concern at this time and you have to start evaluation. You have to start evaluation. I am going to tell you what all things we are going to evaluate in this particular baby. However, the first thing which you should do in the evaluation is to assess the bladder size. Assess the bladder size. Now, this assessment of the bladder size can be done by examination wherein you have to palpate the abdomen and try to uh, know about the approximate bladder size or you can do the ultrasound to measure the bladder size as well as to see any uh, void, uh, unvoided urine inside the bladder. Okay. So, first thing at this point of time at 24 hours when the baby has not passed urine is to assess the bladder size. Okay. Right. Now, these are the indications when you have to evaluate the baby for a possible abnormality in the renal system after birth. One will be not passing urine for more than 24 hours after birth. That is a situation which we are dealing with. Second thing, if the baby is having oliguria, okay. Oliguria, as you can see, is defined by urine output measurement of less than 1 ml per kg per hour for the past 12 hours in a baby who has crossed 24 hours after birth. So, in both these situations, you need to start evaluation. And how are you going to evaluate? As I told you, already the first step is assessment of the urinary bladder size, either by palpation or by doing an ultrasound. Second thing would be to assess and correct dehydration. This is very, very important. One of the common causes where baby does not void urine after birth. So, if there is dehydration, one thing you can tell the mother to increase the duration as well as frequency of feeding. Other thing, you can also provide normal saline infusion, NS, normal saline infusion of 10 ml per kg over 20 minutes. This can be done. This is what we call it as fluid challenge to assess for the probability of dehydration and correction of that with a normal saline. And third thing which you have to do is to evaluate the renal function. This is going to be done with the help of serum creatinine. These are the three steps which you have to do 
following a baby not passing urine after 24 hours after birth and this question was asking about the next step in evaluation so the answer has to be assess the urine bladder size either by palpation or by the ultrasound this would be the first clinical vignette moving on to the second clinical vignette you are evaluating a newborn who is weighing 4 kg and born by cesarean section to a diabetic mother who had poorly controlled diabetes during pregnancy you can see the h1 value which is very well above the normal range and it implies that there is a poor control it is 9 percentage which is very high baby cried soon after birth and is now two hours old now you have a cesarean section baby born to a diabetic mother with a poorly controlled diabetes and baby is cried and is now two hours old that's what okay now while planning investigation what should be the initial testing estimation of what levels is the question you all know that a baby born to a diabetic mother is always always at a high risk of developing hypoglycemia so the initial initial testing should be estimation of glucose levels glucose levels okay right and hypoglycemia is defined as a plasma glucose value of less than 45 milligrams per deciliter this is an important number for you to know okay what is the definition of hypoglycemia and what is the basic reason for hypoglycemia in a baby born to diabetic mother it is basically because of hyperinsulinemia hyperinsulinemia which is going to result in hypoglycemia shortly after birth remember hypoglycemia is a dangerous situation which has to be monitored and treated immediately okay if it is detected so in this question it should be assessment of glucose levels okay right now considering the same scenario i have one more question also you also notice that this baby has a respiratory rate of 66 per minute with a nasal flaring what is the likely cause see respiratory rate of 66 per minute indicates fast breathing right it's an increased rate of breathing because the normal breathing rate in a newborn is 40 to 60 per minute okay also this baby is having nasal flaring which is usage of accessory muscle of respiration both these findings indicate that this baby is having respiratory distress after birth so now the question is very simple what is the likely cause of respiratory distress in this baby okay now taking you back to the scenario this baby was born to a diabetic mother but look at the mode of delivery cesarean section cesarean section now whenever you have a term baby okay this baby is probably term because that is why the weight is 4 kg whenever you have a term baby who is born by cesarean section and having respiratory distress after birth there are many possibilities true but the most likely possibility is going to be TTNB transient tachypnea of newborn what made me think about transient tachypnea of newborn it is the cesarean section history which made me think about the possibility of transient tachypnea of newborn okay because you know that in a baby born by cesarean section there would be retained lung fluids there would be retained lung fluids which would make the baby to have respiratory distress as a clinical finding however this is a condition which is transient and improves within few hours so there is no need for any vigorous management in this baby just a supportive management like o2 supplementation is going to help in the resolution of this particular condition okay so the most likely possibility if this baby is having respiratory distress is transient tachypnea of newborn that would be the question number two moving on to the third clinical vignette you are performing a neonatal resuscitation for a term baby who did not cry after birth at one stage positive pressure ventilation with bag and mass ventilation was started now you have to quickly recap what you have learned in neonatal resuscitation at what stage you will start positive pressure ventilation remember what we do immediately after birth if the baby is not crying that is what is called initial steps of resuscitation And I think most of you can uh, recollect that the initial steps would include temperature by putting the baby in warmer, suctioning of the secretions if there are any secretions, positioning the baby's head by slight extension of the neck, okay, as well as stimulation of breathing, which is tactile stimulation. All these contribute to the initial step. If after the initial steps, 
the heart rate is less than 100 and the baby has no breathing effort okay that is baby is still not crying or not breathing and the heart rate goes to less than 100 that is the time when you actually start positive pressure ventilation okay i think most of you should be able to recollect this so exactly we are at this stage where the baby did not show any response to the initial step and we have started ppv usually ppv is started with bag and mask ventilation to begin with okay so let's imagine that we are in this situation now the question is what would be the first indicator that this baby has responded to positive pressure ventilation okay there may be many indicators like increase in the heart rate color change baby starts crying all these things are there but the first indicator would always always be increase in the heart rate how much to more than 100 per minute okay this is a very very important indicator so that is why the moment we start ppv we start looking at the monitor to check whether the heart rate has improved and that is the first first indicator of response to ppv okay right now the second part of this question is if the baby did not show a response to bag and mass ventilation like heart rate did not improve after bag and mass ventilation what should be the next step in the management this is what we call as ventilation corrective steps ventilation corrective step okay there are few steps which you have to take if the baby is not showing a response to bag and mass ventilation which is remembered by an uh, uh, acronym which is m r sopa the first thing will be m and subsequently the rest of that okay so what is the first thing here it is m m stands for mask reposition mask reposition remember whenever you're applying the back over the uh, whenever you're, you're applying the mask over the baby's uh, face area it should cover the mouth and the nose adequately with a tight seal so that there is no leakage of air okay so you have to make sure that the mark mask is positioned properly so that is the answer for this question also mask reposition then r is for a readjustment of the head readjustment of the head position see whether you have adequately uh, tilted the neck in the extension posture okay right then s is for suction there may be some secretions which are blocking the airway so you have to provide a suction o is for slightly open the mouth and provide the ventilation p is for pressure increase okay increase the pressure while pressing the back okay that is what is pressure increase and even after all of these okay if there is still no response it means the bag and mass ventilation is actually not effective in that baby then you have to go for alternate what is the alternate alternate is to put a et endotracheal tube these are the steps which you will do whenever you don't get a response to bag and mass ventilation the first thing you do is always mass repression and that will be the answer for this particular question okay right so that's about the clinical vignette number three we move on to the clinical vignette number four you are evaluating a four day old neonate in a primary health center with the complaints of jaundice noted since yesterday baby is four days and the jaundice was noted since yesterday that means from day three onwards the jaundice is noted and remember where you are evaluating this baby in a primary health center setting okay now whenever you are seeing this baby at a peripheral level of healthcare, we always follow something called as I M N C I guidelines. You should be knowing the expansion for this I M N C I, which is Integrated Management of Neonatal and Childhood Illness. So you have to evaluate this baby according to those guidelines only. Now the question is, what is the finding which will tell about the possibility of severe jaundice in this particular baby? Okay, so the term is very clear: severe jaundice. Okay. According to the IMNCA guidelines, again, there are certain criteria for to define a severe jaundice, which includes number one, jaundice present in the palms and soles. We always know that this is going to be high level of bilirubin associated. So jaundice present in the palms and soles indicate severe jaundice. Second thing, onset of the jaundice 
is within 24 hours that is the first day after birth itself jaundice is noted it indicates a severe jaundice third is the duration duration more than 14 days also indicates it's a severe jaundice all these are per or as per IMNCA guidelines okay now which one of this you will look for in this particular baby remember it's clearly mentioned that the baby is four days old and the jaundice is since yesterday that means only on day three it has started so that would not be a criteria which I'm going to use here second thing the baby is only four days old so I cannot use the last criteria which is of duration more than 14 days that cannot be used so what is the only criteria I am going to look for to tell that it is possibly a severe jaundice it is jaundice present in the palms and soles I have to follow this okay right jaundice present in the palms and soles so the first thing I am going to look for is whether the jaundice is present in the palms or soles and if it is present I would call it a severe jaundice and always always remember when you have severe jaundice in a newborn baby and you are assessing at a peripheral health care like primary health center you have to immediately refer the baby to a hospital setting okay so in this baby I should be referring to a hospital setting okay right that should be the plan of management if I see severe jaundice features in this particular baby now let's imagine that this baby was shifted to a hospital and in the hospital evaluation was done and the treatment was started I think all of you know the common mode by which we treat the pathological jaundice would be phototherapy look at the situation after starting phototherapy how would you assess the response okay that means how will you see that the baby jaundice is coming down see the common way by which we assess the jaundice initially would be visual assessment where we look at the baby and see which part of the baby's body is having jaundice like the face or chest abdomen like that but remember this baby is already under phototherapy you should remember that under phototherapy the baby appears to be fully whitish or bleached like appearance okay and at this time do you think visual assessment is going to help visual assessment will not at all be effective will not be useful in assessing the response because the baby appears to be almost completely white or bleached out once the phototherapy started so how will you know that the baby is responding or the jaundice is decreasing it is only by assessing serum bilirubin values okay right so the point I want you to remember is that once phototherapy started you don't rely on visual assessment it is only with serum bilirubin values you are going to decide whether the phototherapy has to be continued or can be stopped okay right that would be the clinical vignette number four moving on to vignette number five a 33 week old baby and weighing 1700 gram is born to a primary gravida mother the baby did not require resuscitation and showed stable vitals the baby was transferred to the ICU for routine monitoring okay now the question is this is related to a preterm baby and the question is how will you manage feeding of this particular baby okay remember in a preterm baby just like that we cannot advise direct breastfeeds okay it has to be taken into context of the clinical stability of the baby as well as the weeks of gestation this is a 33 week old baby and the answer is going to come from this okay it is based on the guidelines only any baby who is less than 32 weeks of gestation should be started with feeding okay using nasogastric tube or orogastric tube feeds okay and baby between 32 to 34 weeks of gestation it's going to be palladi feeds or katori spoon feeds katori spoon feeds and if the baby is more than 34 weeks of gestation it should be direct breastfeeds direct breastfeeds one more thing also i'm going to add it here if the baby is less than 28 weeks of gestation 28 weeks of gestation it has to be TPN what is that total parental nutrition because that baby uh, intestine motility is very poor digestion is very very poor that even if you give milk to the tube feeds it is not going to be digested and absorbed so less than 28 weeks it should be total parental nutrition okay right now you see this baby is 
33 weeks of gestation. So where does it lie? It comes under this category. So what should be the mode of feeding? It should be paladai feeds or katori spoon feeds. Okay. So this is the typical example where we decide the initial feeding in the baby based on the gestational age of the baby. Okay, right. Now look at the same scenario and the next question I am going to ask. In this same baby, few hours after birth, the baby developed respiratory distress as well as seizures. Okay, now at this point of time, what should be the feeding plan of this baby? Can you advise any milk to be given to this baby? Absolutely no, because when the baby is having respiratory distress and seizure, the baby is hemodynamically unstable. Hemodynamically unstable baby, correct? And all hemodynamically unstable babies, you should not provide any form of enteral feeding or the milk should not be given. So what should be the mode of feeding? It should be total parenteral nutrition. Okay. So two points I want you to remember uh, in this particular question is when you are going to start TPN or total parental feeds. One, as I told you in the previous slide, if the gestation age is less than 28 weeks or irrespective of the gestation age, if the baby is hemodynamically unstable also, you should start total parental nutrition. Okay. That will be the clinical vignet number five. Moving on to clinical vignet number six, while routine assessment of a healthy term newborn at 48 hours of life, the following finding is noted. Remember, it's a healthy baby, term baby and 48 hours of life. Okay, right. Let us see what is the finding. I'm just going to zoom in that particular area for you to see. All you can see is something like red, red, slightly elevated patches or in other words, erythematous papules are noted. And if you see a little bit more clearly, there are some dots, okay, slight yellowish dots also scattered in that red areas. What could be that yellow dots representing? That yellow dots could be representing the pustules. So in this particular baby, what we are actually seeing is red colored raised areas like papules along with few pustules also. Okay, so I am going to write the description first, which is nothing but um, red colored papulo pustular lesions red colored papillo pustular lesion seen in the baby which is supposed to be the most common rash finding noted in a newborn. What is the name for this? Yes, it is called erythema toxicum. Toxicum is actually not a appropriate name for this because the baby is actually a healthy well baby. So the new name for this erythema toxicum is erythema neonatorum neonatorum okay right fine now this is the most common rash is it normal or abnormal that is a question it is an absolutely normal finding in a newborn it's an absolutely normal finding in the newborn so what would be the management of this particular condition it is nothing but reassurance i will tell the parents that it is absolutely normal and nothing to worry about and this condition usually settles on its own within a few days after birth and very very important the onset when does this rash start showing up very important in this question it is written 48 hours okay in fact this rash appears after 24 hours after birth more than 24 hours after birth not on the first day these are salient points about this particular condition which is the most common rash finding in a newborn baby now one more question suppose i do microscopic examination of this lesion what is it likely to reveal remember usually we don't do a microscopic testing but just for your academic purpose you have to know about this if you do microscopic examination of these lesion it is likely to reveal lot of eosinophils lot of eosinophils it has been asked once in one of the previous competitive exams as well so that's why i want you to make a note of this so that will be about the clinical vignet number six moving on to vignet number seven Following is an x-ray of a preterm neonate who developed abdominal distension with vomiting soon after starting the feeds. Now, all your answer for this question is going to directly come from the x-ray. What you can see in the x-ray, you can see a lot of gas shadows and that too, you can clearly see gas shadows under the diaphragm areas as well as it is like a continuous 
diaphragm outline you are able to see okay from the right side to left side continuously you are able to see uh, with also evidence of air under the diaphragm very clearly what does it tell you this clearly tells you this baby is having pneumo peritoneum and the likely reason for that pneumo peritoneum is intestinal perforation it is intestinal perforation okay right it is intestinal perforation now the question uh, is at this stage what should be the management can you manage this child medically not at all it's a situation of intestinal perforation so you have to manage this child by laparotomy you have to manage the child with laparotomy okay and depending on the findings you have to decide accordingly like for example intestinal resection and reanastomosis may be required in the perforated area so at this time it should be surgical management and the in, uh, management of choice is laparotomy and proceeding further okay right first of all what is this condition could be okay a preterm baby having some abdominal problems intestinal perforation and that too after starting the feeds what could be this condition yes it's a very very dangerous and a emergency situation involving preterm babies in the gastrointestinal tract what is that yes it is n e c necrotizing enterocolitis and i assume and i'm sure all of you must have studied about something called bell staging in assessment of necrotizing enterocolitis so the next question is something related to that what would be the stage of nec in this particular child okay any straightforward answers before i start the discussion of bell staging it is something called bell staging what we are using is the modified bell staging okay any answers for that yes it is stage 3 b would be the stage of nec in this particular child okay just a quick review about the modified bell staging stage 1 is something like non specific abdominal signs and symptoms and stage 1b is a presence of blood in the stool at this stage i cannot diagnose nec so i will call this as suspect nec suspect necrotizing enterocolitis stage 2 is where i will actually make the diagnosis of necrotizing enterocolitis so i'll call it as definite nec definite necrotizing enterocolitis where you can see 2a is nematosis intestinalis which is nothing but air in the intestinal wall air in the intestinal wall that would be nematosis intestinalis then 2b would be nematosis portalis which is air in the portal vein air in the portal vein air in the portal vein that is what is nematosis portalis that is 2b okay now at this stage we can diagnose nec so it's called definite nec stage 3 is actually characterized by lot of complication so it's called complicated nec complicated necrotizing enterocolitis where 3a is peritonitis along with definite ascites and 3b is characterized by the stage which we were discussing in the question which is pneumo peritoneum due to intestinal perforation so this is a quick review about the bell staging in necrotizing enterocolitis for this question because it was pneumo peritoneum the stage is 3b okay right so that will be the clinical vignette number 7 moving on to clinical vignette number 8 you are assessing a neonate following demonstration was done at the time of assessment question is identify this sign what are you doing you are just trying to pull the baby's fingers like this with your fingers and trying to move it to the other side okay remember this as you keep pulling like this passively okay at one point of time you will encounter resistance and that resistance is basically due to the tone of the muscles in that particular limb and what normally happens when you pull a baby's hand like this you are you will not be able to pull it after some time or you will encounter resistance after some time which is typically defined by this position of the elbow elbow crossing the midline or not for a healthy term baby usually there is a good tone so what happened there is a good resistance as well and this elbow will not cross the midline now in this particular baby you can see that this elbow is actually crossing the midline what does it tell you it tells you that the resistance is decreased in this particular baby or in other word it indicate that the tone is actually decreased in the limb of this particular baby okay are able to follow this and the name of this sign is what we call as the 
scarf sign scarf sign and any idea in which group of babies you are going to get this scarf sign positivity is it in a term or preterm it is definitely going to be in a preterm baby only you are going to get scarf sign positive so remember scarf sign positive means elbow crossing the midline now the second part of the question is this sign is useful in the assessment of which parameter i have already told you the answer it is useful in the assessment of tone in the baby it is useful for tone assessment okay remember term baby has a good tone so the elbow will not cross the midline whereas preterm baby has decreased tone so the elbow will actually cross the midline and this is what we call scar sign positive in a preterm that is about this clinical vignette number 8 moving on to clinical vignette number 9 you are evaluating a healthy 3 hour old term female baby born by a normal vagin delivery after a 10 hour labor okay you notice a cone shaped diffuse swelling of the head in this particular baby application of gentle pressure over the swelling leaves an imprint transiently okay now the question is identify the likely diagnosis okay remember there are few conditions which are characterized by swellings in the head after birth one would be caput succedaneum another will be cephalhematoma these are the two common condition which comes to our mind whenever we have a head swelling in a newborn we have to put it in this particular case scenario and tell the diagnosis first thing it's a baby born by normal delivery and after a 10 hour labor which is prolonged labor correct which is more like a prolonged labor in this particular baby number 1 number 2 it's a cone shaped diffuse swelling that is also characteristic diffuse swelling okay and also if you apply that particular uh, pressure over the swelling it leaves an imprint transiently meaning that it's a superficial swelling in a deep swelling and all you will not see an imprint after pressing that area so three findings are there prolonged labor number 2 diffuse swelling as well as superficial swelling so what do you think is the diagnosis yes it's a classical case of caput succedaneum caput succedaneum all the three associations i have written are applicable to caput succedaneum if you see on the other hand cephalhematoma the predisposing factor is not prolonged labor it is instrumental delivery number 1 number 2 cephalhematoma will be a localized swelling as well as it's a deep swelling okay so all the pointers are against the diagnosis of cephalhematoma so clearly the uh, question uh, clearly the condition which we are dealing with here is caput succedaneum okay now what should be the management you don't need to provide any treatment it is only reassurance this condition basically results from fluid accumulation in the scalp area okay due to the prolonged labor the fluid will get reabsorbed uh, within few days after birth typically around 2 to 3 days after birth and it is going to resolve spontaneously so no need for any particular treatment for this particular treatment for this condition and it is only reassurance which is required so that's about the clinical vignette number 9 you are evaluating a newborn after delivery um difficult vaginal delivery due to shoulder dystocia and you notice paucity of movements on the left upper limb left upper limb that means the movements on the left side of the limb has decreased you also notice that in the same side finger movements were normal and palma grass was present now the question is in this setting what could be the likely diagnosis you have to take into consideration the clinical features as well as what happened to the baby at the time of birth remember it's a difficult delivery and it was a shoulder dystocia that is a history which is already given along with that the baby is also having decreased movements of the upper limbs whenever you you notice any paucity of movements in one limb alone it could be due to a nerve injury that the baby is not having good movements of the upper limb or it could be due to a bony injury also which could be something like a fracture 
or dislocation in the uh, bones in the upper limb that's why baby is not moving the uh, upper limb okay right so these could be the two possibilities either a bone injury or a nerve injury now look at the rest of the question you also notice that in the same side finger movements were normal so what does it tell you it tells you it is likely to be a nerve injury only that is why some areas are actually having a normal movement and some are having an abnormal movement if it is actually bone injury baby will not move that entire limb at all okay right so likely possibility is going to be nerve injury affecting the left upper limbs okay and this nerve injury is usually in the form of brachial plexus injury and you all know that the um, shoulder dystocia is a condition which can predispose to the development of brachial plexus injury in a newborn okay now we have to find out what could be the likely injury as well the two common things which comes to our mind are the herb's palsy and one more is the klumke's palsy which condition can be ruled out in this particular question in this particular question klumke's paralysis can be ruled out because it is very clearly mentioned that the finger movements were normal and palma grass was present if it is klumke's paralysis actually the finger movement should have been impaired as well as the palma grass should have been absent so for all likely possibility in this question the diagnosis is herb's palsy and the nerve roots which are affected include c5 and c6 okay right so this is what will be my diagnosis in this particular question now the second part of this clinical weakness is this. moro reflex if it is elicited in this baby what would be the likely finding you all know that moro reflex is a bilateral uh, elicitable reflex but here the left side upper limb will not show any response so it is going to be a unilateral reflex it's going to be unilateral reflex that would be the expected finding when you do the moro reflex in this baby so that's about the clinical weakness number 10 Moving on to vignet number eleven, a three point five kg term male baby developed respiratory distress soon after birth, and X-ray showed the following finding. Okay, if you see the characteristic finding in the X-ray, one is that the lung fields are appearing fully white in color and not black in color. This is what we call white out lungs, or also called as a ground glass appearance of the lung. what is a commonest condition which comes to your mind whenever i say respiratory distress in a newborn along with about white out of a ground glass appearance of the lung it is nothing but rds what is that it's a respiratory distress syndrome which is going to be due to deficiency or immaturity of the surfactant but rds is something which is usually noted in preterm babies correct preterm babies now in the question if you see it is written it's a term baby so it is unlikely to be an rds not only that look at the second part of the question the baby did not respond to surfactant therapy and died within few hours this is also against the diagnosis of rds why because if it is rds it should have responded to surfactant therapy we all know about it so it's unlikely to be rds and the baby also died soon after birth next there is a family history of a sibling death with a similar features okay this means that it is a inherited condition as well it's a inherited condition do you think rds is a inherited condition absolutely no so all this points does not tell you that it is rds but it is a condition which is mimicking like an rds so what could be that particular condition okay it is going to be a case of something called an inherited condition only a rare condition in fact but uh it is something which has been asked previously in your exam so you should know about it called as pap what is that pulmonary alveolar proteinosis i will give you a brief note about this particular condition pulmonary alveolar proteinosis i am writing like this pap which is a short form of this pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is due to accumulation of a cellular surfactant a cellular surfactant in the alveoli what is the meaning of this normally when the sur it is something like a old surfactant which accumulates inside the alveoli normally when the surfactant becomes old okay it has to be removed from the alveoli okay with the help of this pulmonary alveolar macrophages 
Now, what happens in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis? Either there is a uh, mutation in the surfactant protein, so it is not removed by the macrophages, or the or there is something called GM CSF receptor protein defect, which makes the macrophages to be very ineffective. So, in all these situations, what happens? The old surfactant is not removed from the alveoli and stays inside the alveoli like that. And you all know that the old surfactant cannot have any function. So, that is why it is not able to lower the surface tension and predisposes to what? It predisposes to alveolar collapse. It predisposes to alveolar collapse followed by respiratory distress in this particular condition. And why does it mimic RDS? Because of the alveolar collapse itself, it gives rise to the appearance of white out or the ground glass appearance. Okay, right? So, what is the situation? Again, a quick recollect recollection of what I have told you. It is accumulation of acellular surfactant inside the alveoli. That is why when you give surfactant also, this condition will not respond. Why? Because all the alveoli are occupied by the inactive surfactant. So, even if you give an exogenous surfactant also, it is not going to work. That is why in this particular child, the child did not respond to surfactant therapy. Are you able to follow this? So, this is a condition of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which radiologically mimics respiratory distress syndrome. The next part of the question is, how will you establish diagnosis in this particular baby? The only way is by lung biopsy. Okay. What will you see in the lung biopsy? You have to look for the evidence of that old acellular surfactant, which is appearing as a granular eosinophilic material, granular eosinophilic material, which is PAS positive as well as diastase resistant. This is a characteristic description of this particular um, inactive surfactant inside the alveoli. Okay, so that's about this particular clinical vignette. Moving on to the vignette number 12. Calculate the cellulose score for a neonate who is having paradoxical breathing, marked chest as well as zephoid retraction, along with minimal nasal flaring and expiratory grunt audible only with a stethoscope. So, this is a situation where we have to do the cellulose scoring based on the findings which are given. So, before I am going to tell the score, you should know about the cellulose scoring. Okay, this is one of the standard scoring system which we use in a newborn to assess the severity of respiratory distress. As you can see, there are five components. Basically, the first four components are related to retraction, namely the upper chest, lower chest, zephyr retraction, as well as nasal flaring. And last one would be the grunting, okay, which is an abnormal sound here during respiratory distress. And it is graded like 0, 1 and 2. Okay, to remember in a simplified way, um, the middle three things, namely the lower chest retractions, Zephoid retraction, nasal retraction can be considered together where zero score means there is no retractions at all. There is no retractions at all. Then one mean something like minimal retractions or we can remember like just visible retractions that is called one score. And two means marked retractions or severe retractions in all these areas. This is what is for the retractions part. Then upper chest means you are comparing the chest movements with the abdominal movements. Okay. In zero, what happens is the chest movements are synchronized. The chest movements are synchronized with the abdominal movements. One means chest is lagging behind the abdomen during inspiration. That is what is called lagging. Chest is lagging behind the abdomen. And two refers to a seesaw breathing. Something like this, the chest is moving inwards and the abdomen is moving outwards. Okay, that is what is called seesaw movement, which indicates severe retractions inside the chest. Okay, right. Talking about the grunting part, zero means there is no grunting. One means grunting, which is audible with the stethoscope. Audible with the stethoscope. Two means grunting, which is audible without stethoscope or with a naked ear itself, you can able to hear the grunting. That is what is called two scoring. Okay. So, this is the Silverman scoring system which you have to remember and based on the scoring, we can divide into mild, moderate and severe. Mild refers to a score of less than 5. 5 to 7 is moderate and more than 7 is severe. 
that is what is a Silverman scoring interpretation. Now I will take you back to the question. Now we will do the scoring system. First one, what is it? Paradoxical breathing. Paradoxical breathing refers to chest is going inward and the abdomen is going outward or the seesaw respiration which correspond to score of 2 in this particular baby. Marked chest retraction and xiphoid retraction. Okay. What is the meaning? It is again corresponding to a score of 2 which is marked retractions. Okay. As well as chest retractions are also marked. So again given a score of 2. Minimal nasal flaring. So I will give a score of 1 for this. An expiratory grunt which is audible only with the stethoscope. Grunting only with the stethoscope will again give a score of 1 itself. So what is the total scoring in this particular baby? It is 8 score. What is the meaning of 8? Okay, total score is 8. What is the meaning of 8? 8 indicates a severe respiratory distress. Okay, 8 indicates severe respiratory distress in this particular baby. And please remember, for severe respiratory distress, the management is mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation. And at this stage, you should also consider surfactant therapy. Surfactant therapy. Okay. One question to be remembered here. What is the route by which you deliver surfactant? It is nothing but endotracheal route. It is endotracheal route. Are you able to follow this? Okay. So that will be for this clinical vignette, which we are actually going to do the scoring system in a baby with respiratory distress, assess the severity and manage accordingly. Moving on to clinical vignette number 13. You are evaluating a small neonate with a birth weight below 10th percentile. Please remember birth weight below 10th percentile is referred to as SGA baby, small for gestation age baby. That's a definition. Okay, right. This baby was born as a 32 weeks preterm to a 25 year old primary gravida mother who had severe PAH, pregnancy induced hypertension. The baby had an emaciated look as well as loose skin folds were noted. The weight of the baby is 2 kg and the height is 50 cm. Now, the question is, what is the explanation for these findings in the baby? All these findings, what is the explanation? First thing you have to remember is that SGA baby can be due to a normal variant which is called constitutional SGA wherein there is no problems in the baby as such. That is what we call constitutionally small for gestation age baby. And one more is a pathological condition which is IUGR. What is a condition in this baby? Is it IUGR or constitutional? It is definitely IUGR because you can see in this question it is written like this. What is it? Emaciated look as well as loose skin folds which indicate evidence of wasting. And presence of wasting would indicate the possibility of IUGR in this particular baby. Okay. Intrauterine growth restriction. Okay. And also you can see there is a risk factor why this baby should develop IUGR. What is that? It is very clearly written the mother had severe PAH. Severe PAH. Okay. Which is actually one of the maternal factors predisposing to intrauterine growth restriction. So definitely it's going to be uh, IUGR as a clinical diagnosis in this particular baby. Okay. And please remember IUGR can be due to maternal factors or due to a fetal factor. So the baby's own problems. If it is a maternal factor causing IUGR, it results in asymmetrical IUGR. Okay. Asymmetrical IUGR. And if it is a fetal factor, it results in symmetrical IUGR. Okay. Now, how are you going to differentiate between symmetrical and asymmetrical IUGR? We do a mathematical calculation called as PI. What is that? Ponderal index. In fact, the next part of the question is related to calculate the ponderal index in this particular baby. Ponderal index is calculated as weight in grams divided by length in centimeters cube the whole into 100 that is how it is calculated now taking you back to the question look at the parameters which has been given weight is 2 kilogram and length is 50 centimeters 
So 2 kilograms means 2000 grams divided by length in centimeters cube that is 50 into 50 into 50 into 100. So if you try to make a simplified calculation all these zeros will get cancelled. So it would be numerated 200 divided by 5 into 5 into 5 this is 125 which is roughly equal to 1.6 okay. Now what should be the interpretation ponderal index is divided like this ponderal index of less than 2 and more than 2. Less than 2 is asymmetrical IUGR and more than 2 is symmetrical IUGR. So ponderal index of 1.6 is nothing but yes asymmetrical IUGR. It is nothing but asymmetrical IUGR and it correlates very well with the scenario also. Why? Because it is written maternal factor predisposing to IUGR. What was the maternal factor? It was PAH predisposing to IUGR and I have already told you maternal factors causing IUGR is a type of asymmetric IUGR only which is very well correlated with the ponderal index calculation in this particular baby. Okay. So that's about the clinical vignette number 13. We move on to vignette number 14. You are evaluating a term SGA baby who appears to be sick with jaundice as well as petechiae. On evaluation, microcephaly and hepatomegaly were noted. Further testing reveals chorioretinitis and sensorineural hearing loss. So you can see a lot of findings are noted in this particular baby. One involving the brain, that's why microcephaly. Another one involving the liver like hepatomegaly and jaundice as well as chorioretinitis and sensorineural hearing loss. In view of these findings, possibility of an intrauterine infection was considered. Definitely, it is one of the differential which should be kept in mind. Any sick baby where you are not able to explain all the findings, you think about the possibility of number one, sepsis. Number two, you have to keep the possibility of intrauterine infection as well. Now, this question is leading us into the possibility of intrauterine infection. So, in this clinical setting, which condition should be considered? Many intrauterine infections have microcephaly as well as hepatomegaly. However, presence of chorioretinitis and sensorineural hearing loss, okay, these two findings will help you to consider two intrauterine infections as possible associations. One would be cytomegalovirus, another one would be toxoplasmosis. In both these conditions, okay, these two findings are noted. So, I will keep in mind in the intrauterine category or the torch infection category, these two are possible in this particular child. Now, how will I make a distinction between these two conditions? Of course, I have to do the investigation. Look at the next part of the question. Which radiological investigation would further help in the diagnosis? It is going to be brain imaging. It's going to be brain imaging which will help me in further diagnosis okay and in the brain imaging i am going to look for calcifications inside the brain which will help me to differentiate between the two conditions calcifications in the brain okay remember i can also do the other investigation like serological investigation looking for antibodies okay that is correct however the question was not that the question is which radiological investigation for that i should answer brain imaging where i have to look for calcification Look at the further part of the question. Suppose brain imaging reveals periventricular calcification with cortical atrophy. What should be the further investigation? Now I have to decide what could be the possibility based on periventricular calcification. That is very, very characteristic of CMV infection, cytomegalovirus infection. Remember, if the brain imaging reveals diffuse parenchymal calcification, Okay, diffuse parenchymal calcifications, then my possibility would be toxoplasmosis. Then my possibility would be toxoplasmosis. Okay, that is how in a brain imaging I can differentiate whether it is toxoplasmosis or cytomegalovirus. Here, due to periventricular calcification, my likely possibility is CMV. Now, the question is which further investigation will establish the diagnosis? Of course, now I have to go for virus isolation with the help of culture. 
and what will be the best sample for this particular uh, virus isolation of the culture the best sample is going to be not blood sample any guesses on what is the best sample it is a urine sample because urine is supposed to have the highest concentration of the uh, uh, CMV virus and that is why urine sample is the best sample for virus isolation or culture in this particular case okay that will be about the clinical vignette number 14 Moving on to clinical vignette number 15. You are evaluating a newborn who had a central cyanosis with fast breathing notice soon after birth. After administering 100% oxygen, cyanosis is still persisting with no changes in PaO2 or the arterial oxygen saturation uh, on ABG analysis. The question is, what should be the next step in arriving at a diagnosis? Next step. Okay, first let us think about the clinical possibility and then we will plan the next step. See, this is a baby who is having central cyanosis. In a neonate who is having central cyanosis, the two possibilities are whether it's a respiratory problem or it's a cardiac problem like a cyanotic congenital heart disease. Okay, right. So, to differentiate only, uh, to differentiate between these two conditions only, we are doing this 100% O2 testing which is what we call hyperoxia test hyperoxia test and you can see the result of this hyperoxia testing cyanosis is still persisting with no changes in PaO2 that means this oxygen is not helping the cyanosis in this particular child what does this tell you cyanosis which is persisting even after oxygen administration favors cardiac problem it favors a cardiac problem please make a note of this so, possibility is cyanotic congenital heart disease. You should remember that if it is a respiratory problem, the cyanosis will improve. Cyanosis will improve. And PaO2 also will improve once you give oxygen administration. But in a cyanotic congenital heart disease, it is not going to improve. That is a point which I want you to remember. So, possibility in this baby with central cyanosis is cyanotic congenital heart disease. So, what should be the next step in arriving at a diagnosis? I have to do which investigation? It is nothing but echocardiography. Echocardiography will help me to arrive at a diagnosis. Okay, right. Now, there are many cyanotic congenital heart disease. Look at the next part of the question. While awaiting echocardiography reports, what would be the most likely congenital heart disease I would be thinking in mind, which cause cyanosis in the neonatal period? Okay, you all know the most common cyanotic CHD means congenital heart disease would be tetralogy of aloe. Will that be the possibility in this particular child? It is unlikely because in tetralogy of aloe, the onset of cyanosis is usually outside the neonatal period or after the neonatal period or after one month. That is what you have to remember. Usually, Tetralogy of Allo, uh, onset of cyanosis will be little late. That is what. So, it's not going to be tetralogy of Allo in this question. So, what will be the answer for this question? It is going to be TGA, transposition of great artery. That is a condition which present with cyanosis beginning in the neonatal period itself. So, please make a note of this. So, answer for this is, question is most likely possibility. Most likely possibility is TGA. It can be any other congenital heart disease also like right like tricuspid atresia, TAPVC and all. But most likely possibility is TG because among the cyanotic congenital heart disease, the one which presents with cyanosis in the neonatal period, most commonly it is TG and hence the answer for this question. That is about the clinical vignette number 15. Moving on to the next clinical vignette number 16, you are evaluating a term neonate and with a birth weight of 3 kg and you notice hypertrichosis at the lower back or the lumbosacral region. Hypertrichosis refers to the increased uh, hair or what we call the tuft of hair present in the lumbosacral region. This baby is otherwise not having any issues and you are doing a routine evaluation. Okay. Now, presence of a tuft of hair or increased hair in the lumbosacral region is actually one of the clues to make you the to make you suspect the possibility of one important embryological problem in that particular area. What is that? Yes, it could be a pointer that the child could have an underlying neural tube defect in the form of what? Spina 
bifida occulta spina bifida occulta it is actually a clue to suspect the possibility of spina bifida occulta in that particular region this should actually strike your mind whenever you see a tuft of hair in the lower back of a uh, small baby okay now thinking about this possibility the question is what should be the next step in the evaluation of this particular baby okay we have still not confirmed our diagnosis we are only thinking about the possibility of spina bifida occulta so the question is next step see this type of words is where you have to be careful okay there will be questions like next step definitive step all those things next step is just to think about the further possibility of um, spina bifida occulta with an investigation so the question is very simple what should be the next investigation in evaluation of these babies it is going to be ultrasound of the lumbosacral region to look for the possibility of spina bifida occulta where you will typically see a splitting in the spinal vertebral bone on the posterior aspect so the next step always has to be ultrasound of the lumbosacral region now look at the next question which investigation should be done for a definitive diagnosis okay again here investigation would be radiological investigation but here we should not only look at that lumbosacral region we have to evaluate the entire spine along with the brain because this is a neural tube defect so any part of the neural tube other than the lumbosacral region also can be affected so the next investigation should be mri spine and the brain area to have a complete evaluation of the neural tube okay right so that should be the uh, definitive diagnosis so can you see the wordings in the question will change the answer next step will be ultrasound but the best or the definitive investigation is going to be mri of the spine and the brain region clear okay so that's about this particular clinical vignet now few more points i would add to this particular clinical scenario from nelson textbook of pediatrics which gives you guidelines wherein if you find a cutaneous lesion this is in the lumbosacral region what situation will require further imaging okay in this particular question i told you hypertrichosis or tuft of hair similarly there are other things also like if you find a subcutaneous mass or a lipoma in the lumbosacral region you have to think about neural tube defect as a possibility second would be hairy patch which has been already discussed third is a dermal sinus or cyst fourth will be something called dimples okay right presacral dimples okay or atypical dimples okay like those which are very deep or more than 5 mm or the distance from the anal verge is more than 25 mm then they are called atypical dimples which requires further evaluation with a radiological investigation and finally any vascular lesion in the lumbosacral for example a hemangioma or a telangiectasia also you have to do further imaging to look for the possibility of neural tube defect okay right now moving on to the clinical vignette number 17 a seven year old male child is bought by his parents with the complaints of being short when compared with his friends he appears otherwise well and has a normal systemic examination his measured height is 100 cm okay this is a seven year old boy who is having a height of 100 cm and he is short that is what his parents are feeling now just a rough question does this child actually appear to be short in fact it is yes because you all know that roughly 100 centimeter would be the height which is attained by a four year old child this child is already seven years but the height is 100 centimeter so my clinical possibility also is that this child is definitely having a short stature but still just to make my diagnosis very clear what should be the next step in the evaluation of this particular child okay i have to prove that it is short stature for that i have to plot this measured height in the who chart what is the chart which is going to help of course it is a height for a chart so the next step would be plot the values of height in the height for a chart and by height for a chart when will you define short stature whenever the value of height is below third percentile or in terms of standard deviation below minus two standard deviations then i will call it as short stature so the next step would be to plot the values in the chart and say that it is short stature let's imagine that you have confirmed short stage in this child in fact the height is below third percentile or below minus two standard deviation now the parents are anxious because you're saying that your child is definitely short so the parents are anxious 
while explaining to the parents what should be your most likely cause of short stature in this particular child. So this is a very blanket question where I'm asking if this child is having short stature, what is the likely cause of short stature? Now I will take you back to the question. It's already written child appears otherwise well and has a normal systemic examination. So for all likely possibility, is this going to be a normal variant or a pathological variant? First of all, it is likely to be a normal variant. And in the normal variant, there are two types. What are the two types? One is a constitutional delay. One is the constitutional delay. Another one is a familial short stature. Familial short stature. Now both are possible in this particular child itself. I don't have any further information to comment on the final diagnosis. But still, when I'm explaining to the parents, I will reassure them. First of all, I will reassure the parents that your child is probably having a normal variant short stature only and just for an mcq purpose out of these two normal variant which is more common constitutional delay is the overall most common cause of short stature i would tell about that possibility to the parents okay that your child is probably having a normal variant and most likely in that category it is going to be constitutional delay just some quick words of uh, differentiation between constitutional delay and familial short stature. In constitutional delay, the final height would be normal in case of constitutional delay. Whereas in familial short stature, even when these children become adults, they are short. That is the point. Next thing to be noted is puberty and bone age. Both are delayed in case of constitutional delay. You can take a clue from the name itself constitutional delay both are delayed in constitutional delay whereas in family short stature both puberty and bone age are normal for the age okay these are some quick ways of differentiating between the two types of short stature okay right normal variants of short stature that's about this particular clinical vignette moving on to the clinical vignette number 18 you are evaluating a 10 month old child who has not yet attained dentition the infant's height is 75 cm and the weight is 8 kg with a birth weight of 2.7 kg. He is able to stand with support and articulate bisyllable. These are the information which we have. The question is, what is the developmental age of the child based on the information which is provided? Okay, now we have to focus on the developmental milestones in this particular child. What are the two things which are given? Child is able to stand with support and articulate by syllables. Okay, stand with support is roughly by the age of 10 months. Articulate by syllable again 9 to 10 months of age. So what is the developmental age of this child? The developmental age of the child is also around 10 months of age which is actually corresponding to the chronological age. What is the chronological age of the child? Chronological age of the child is 10 months old. It is already given. So this child is having a normal development for his age or there is no developmental delay. So this is a very simple question where I am telling you some milestones in the child and I am asking you the developmental age of the child. It is a very straightforward one. Now look at the next part of the question. Now this same child and we are considering this question the parents are concerned that the baby has not yet attained dentition yet what should be your advice what is the age of the child it is 10 month old child correct and the baby has not yet attained dentition what should be your advice remember even though we have studied the normal age at dentition for a child okay or the first teeth appearance is around six months of age remember not all children are going to attain a teeth at around six months of age it is roughly around 8 to 10 months only they start attaining the teeth. And can I call in this particular child as a delayed dentition? Can I tell that this um, that uh, the parents, okay, that your child is having delayed dentition? I certainly cannot say like that because the term delayed dentition, the term delayed dentition refers to a condition wherein even after 13 months also, even after 13 months also, child has not attained a teeth, then it is called delayed dentition. Now you look at the age of the child, child is only 12 months. So what will I tell the parents? It is nothing of a concern. Okay, you have to wait for few more months before the child starts developing a teeth. So what I will do, I will simply reassure the parents, 
reassurance and ask this child to come for follow up after few months and probably by the time the child is around 1 year or so child would have definitely attained the teeth and i would start evaluating only even after 13 months also the child is not attained the teeth then i would start evaluating for a probable cause okay the common causes for delayed dentition would include malnutrition rickets and some hormonal problem usually hypothyroidism so i will start evaluation for all these conditions not at this age only after 13 months if the child has not attained the teeth so at this time only thing which is required is reassurance okay that's about this particular clinical vignette number 18 we move on to clinical vignette number 19 parents of a 2 year old child are concerned that the child has multiple episodes in the recent past where he would become frustrated and angry following these event that is following a frustration child would suddenly stop any activity and become still with no noticeable breathing and would turn blue what is the typical description of this case this is something like um an initiating event in the form of frustration or angriness where the child i will write like this angriness as a frustrating event as the initial event following which child becomes still child becomes still that means no activity as well as no breathing no breathing and following that the child becomes blue what is this sequence of event this is the typical description of an important important condition called breath holding spells something called as a breath holding spells wherein child is holding the breath holding the breath okay following an initial event like angriness or crying or frustration like that and after that child becomes completely bluish in color this is the typical sequence of event which is described in um breath holding spell some children instead of turning blue they become pale okay so we have two types of breath holding spell one is a cyanotic breath holding spell where the child turns blue another one is pallid breath holding spell where the child becomes pale in color or completely white in color this is a condition which actually has its onset after 6 months after 6 months it actually peaks by the age of 2 years typically noted in this particular question also and usually it resolves within 5 years within 5 years of age okay right now an important point to note is that one whenever a parent sees this even definitely they would think it is abnormal but you have to reassure the parents that this is something like a behavioral problem in the child which is going to settle as the child is going to become older so if i ask you what should be the management of this particular condition it is again reassurance will be the management of this condition only thing is that the parent should ensure that the child should be staying in a quiet place or a uh, place which is uh, without having any sharp objects like that so that the child is unlikely to injure himself or herself and all that is required is to um, not give attention undue attention to this particular condition and leave the child as such for few minutes and the child should be okay okay that's what you have to remember tell the parents that it is something not to be too much worried about and it is usually going to settle when the child becomes older that is a management of breath holding spells okay now look at the next question in the scenario any associated condition should be ruled out in this particular child of course yes i have to rule out iron deficiency or anemia okay iron deficiency anemia because that condition is associated with an increased association with this um, breath holding spell so if it is going to be detected i have to supplement iron in this particular child as a part of management okay so that's about the question number 19 uh, which is related to breath holding spells moving on to clinical vignette number 20 you are evaluating a 7 year old male who is having short stature and you notice that the height is 100 cm upper segment of 50 cm and lower segment of 50 cm the weight is 24 kg and he appears slightly obese with a round doll like facial appearance 
Further evaluation reveals delayed dentition and a bone age of 3 years. Let us try to interpret this question and then try to provide a diagnosis because the question itself is about what is a likely diagnosis. See, it is clearly written the child is having short stature and definitely 100 cm for a 7 year old child is definitely short. And in all short children, okay, what we try to do is to differentiate into something called proportionate short stature and disproportionate short stature. Proportionate and disproportionate short stature. Okay. And this is done with the help of US LS ratio. Upper segment, lower segment ratio. Now, in this particular child, it is clearly written upper segment is 50 and lower segment is also 50. So, what is the ratio for this child? It is 1 is to 1 upper segment, lower segment ratio. Is it normal ratio for this child or an abnormal ratio? Remember, for a 7 to 10 year old child, the normal ratio itself is 1 is to 1. So, I will say in this particular child, the upper segment, lower segment ratio is normal for that age or in other words, is this a proportionate short stature or a disproportionate short stature? Definitely, it's a proportionate short stature. Okay, if the ratio is normal, you call it proportionate short stature. If the ratio is abnormal, then you call it as disproportionate short stature. Okay, that is what. So, simple, in this particular child, we are dealing with a short stature, number one. Number two, it's a proportionate short stature. There are many conditions which can cause proportionate short stature. For example, all normal variants. I was discussing some time back, what are the normal variants? Constitution delay and family short stature. They have proportionate short stature. Even malnutrition cases, they have proportionate short stature. And growth hormone deficiency also, you have proportionate short stature only. So, all these possibilities can be there. What is the diagnosis in this question? It is going to come from the next part of the question, which tells you about the further features in this child. What are the features which are noted? He is appearing slightly obese, but the important point here is doll-like facial appearance, doll-like facial appearance. And one more important thing is delayed dentition. Along with that, you see the bone age. Bone age of 3 years. What is the chronological age of the child? The chronological age of the child is 7 years, but the bone age is only 3 years. This tells you it is a severe delay in the bone age. Severe delay in the bone age. So, we have 3 more clues in this child. Delayed dentition, severely delayed bone age, as well as doll-like facial appearance. What does this point to? It clearly points to growth hormone deficiency as the possibility in this particular question. So, my clinical diagnosis according to the given situation is going to be growth hormone deficiency. Okay, right. Now, the next part is how are you going to confirm your diagnosis? Of course, I have to do the growth hormone level estimation. Then only I can confirm my diagnosis. But here is a point. If you randomly estimate growth hormone level, it is going to be very inaccurate. Why? Because growth hormone uh, just like many other pituitary hormones is secreted in a pulsatile manner. So, random measurement of growth hormone will not be helpful. This is something which is important. So, what you have to do? First, I have to provocate or stimulate the growth hormone and then test for it levels. Okay, this is what we call it as provocative testing or stimulative testing, stimulation testing, provocative testing. And for this provocative testing, you have to use some agents. What are the agents which can be used? This includes insulin, clonidin or glucagon. Any one of this I will be using. First, I will give this and then look for the levels of growth hormone. Even after stimulation or provocation with these agents, the growth hormone level will remain low. What is the cutoff to call it as growth hormone deficiency? When the level is less than 10 nanograms per ml, it is very, very suggestive of growth hormone deficiency. Okay, so that is how I will confirm the diagnosis in this particular clinical scenario. Okay, that's about the clinical vignette number 20. We move on to clinical vignette number 21. You are evaluating a three-year-old boy with intellectual disabilities and visual difficulties. You also notice that he is unusually tall with a long slender fingers. 
he is born out of a consanguineous marriage they are giving you a clue that this is a inherited condition inherited condition that's why they are giving you the clue as consanguineous marriage what is the other finding downward lens dislocation or inferior lens dislocation is noted now the question is what is a likely diagnosis okay see whenever you have a tall child and that to an inherited condition the usual condition which comes to your mind is marfan syndrome it is marfan syndrome correct i think that is something which strikes our mind whenever we see an unusually tall person okay and that too with as an inherited condition okay i think all of you know marfan syndrome is inherited as an autosomal dominant condition okay right so we can suspect the possibility but is this marfan syndrome first of all it is very very unlikely because it is written child is having intellectual disability what is intellectual disability means low iq does marfan syndrome have low iq no marfan syndrome patients usually have a normal iq number 1 number 2 they can have long and slender fingers what is this long and slender fingers called it is called arachnodactyly that can actually be noted in marfan syndrome only okay so that is not a point against marfan syndrome now look at the last point what is that downward lens dislocation is noted of course in marfan syndrome also you notice uh, lens dislocation but it's a superior lens dislocation okay upward lens dislocation not downward lens dislocation so i have told you points and saying that it is not a marfan syndrome so what is the other condition in children which looks like a marfan syndrome but has certain different set of features and the answer for this particular question also any guesses on what is a likely diagnosis that is also an inherited condition but here it is autosomal recessive inheritance any condition comes to your mind now yes it is homocystinuria homocystinuria okay homocystinuria just like marfan syndrome has tall stature with long slender fingers or arachnodactyly but the point of difference is in homocystinuria one i have already told you autosomal recessive mode of inheritance second is they have low iq as well as inferior lens dislocation inferior lens dislocation this is how you differentiate homocystinuria from marfan syndrome okay and that is why in this particular question my diagnosis is homocystinuria and not marfan syndrome so the learning point objective from this question is how to differentiate between marfan syndrome and another condition which looks like it in the form of homocystinuria that is what is the aim of discussion in this particular question one more question also what is a basic metabolic defect in homocystinuria you all know that it's a metabolic disorder due to accumulation of homocystine why the homocystine accumulates in the body it is due to an enzyme deficiency you all know that homocystine normally should have been converted into cystathionine with the help of an enzyme called cystathionine i'm writing like in a short form cystathionine beta synthase cystathionine beta synthase now in homocystinuria there is a deficiency of this particular enzyme so this step is not going to accumulate and homocystine level will accumulate inside the body it can get excreted in the urine as well that's why it's called homocystinuria okay right so that is the um, biochemical part of homocystinuria which you should be knowing about that is the clinical vignette number 21 and we move on to the next clinical vignette vignette number 22 you have a 2 year old child who is weighing 6 kg is presenting to the primary health center with fever for 2 days as well as poor feeding on examination child has a visible severe wasting with no pedal edema or pallor mid upper arm circumference is 11 cm see what should be your clinical diagnosis at this time child is 2 uh, years old but the weight is very less can you see it is only 6 kg okay okay you should know that a normal child 3 kg becomes 6 kg by the age of 5 to 6 months itself but this child is already 2 years old and it is only 6 kg definitely there is a uh, weight loss or very inadequate weight gain in this particular child along with that child is also having fever for 2 days with poor feeding and you can see other finding visible severe wasting 
as well as mid upper arm circumference is 11 centimeter what does this tell you this is a diagnosis of sam what is that severe acute malnutrition how do we typically define severe acute malnutrition it is something like this child having a weight for height below minus 3 standard deviation next presence of bipedal edema and third is mid arm circumference less than 11.5 centimeters and any one of this is sufficient to make a diagnosis of sam clinically okay and in this particular child we have the evidence in the form of mac mid arm circumference less than 11.5 cm it's only 11 cm in this child so for all clinical purpose this child is having severe acute malnutrition okay now the question is what should be the immediate management of this child remember you are seeing this child in a primary health center can you manage this child in the phc itself it is possible however there is one thing which tells you that you should not manage in this phc level why what is that it is poor feeding remember if the child is having an adequate feeding or a good appetite then we can manage the child in a phc level itself but this child is having a poor feeding which is one of the points which will tell you that you cannot manage this child in phc and this child requires hospital administration so from a phc i have to immediately refer the child to a hospital setting okay that should be the initial management any further management has to be done from after inpatient admission in the hospital only okay look at the next part of the question after after hospital admission initial evaluation should be aimed at which complication you know that there are so many complication which can occur in a child with severe acute malnutrition what we usually remember with a mnemonic as shielded i think all of you know about this what is this s for the sugar or hypoglycemia h for hypothermia i for infection el for electrolyte imbalance de is for dehydration and last d is for the deficiency which is micronutrient deficiency all these complication can occur in a child with sam but initially what are the complication which you are going to target at it is something like the first three complication which are supposed to be like a triad of complication meaning if one of these complication occur the other complication is also usually associated and that is what we need to initially evaluate and treat in this particular child what is that hypoglycemia sugars which is defined by a glucose value of less than 54 mg per deciliter next one would be hypothermia which is defined as a axillary temperature less than 35 degrees 35 degrees centigrade okay then i for infection which is usually due to gram negative bacilli like e coli or klebsiella these are the three things which you should um, initially evaluate and treat for in a child with severe acute malnutrition okay that's about the clinical vignette number 22